Welcome to Art in the Outdoors, a virtual nature walk with Shannon Colas. Amidst the current pandemic, our relationship to the outdoors has shifted in compelling ways for many. In an effort to explore the dynamics of human connection to nature, we will speak today with Shannon Colas, the artist behind Strata, an exhibition now on view at the Berman Museum of Art. Strata was largely inspired by the artist's relationship with the outdoor landscapes of Fort McMurray and Alberta, Canada a region which is currently experiencing ecological and economic tension. Today we will discuss Shannon's personal connection to nature in Alberta and the Fort McMurray oil sands operations occurring there. In the spirit of an interview in the woods, we will be taking a virtual nature walk through Collegeville's own Hunsberger Woods, a natural area near Asinus College and the Bourbon Museum of Art. So my name is Kristen and I'm a junior at Asinus College with an environmental studies and art double major and I'm lucky enough to be here today with Shannon Colas, a Canadian contemporary artist and I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do and what your background is. Sure, no problem and thanks for having me Kristen. Yeah. Um, I am I am a professor and an artist. I'm a teacher and an artist and um, I teach at the University of Maryland and there I teach um, digital media, so specifically video and sound. Um, but I'm also an artist and I create uh, immersive exhibitions like the one that I have installed at your sinus. Um, and ones that really integrate uh, digital technologies with material things um, using, you know, mostly sound and video in, you know, spaces. And so this idea of immersion is really how the body experiences the work. Um, I'll just give you a really quick background. So I have uh, a studio MFA in printmaking. So that's where the material making comes from. Um, but I went back to grad school and I took a degree in computation art. So I found a way of, of kind of weaving the two practices together. And I think that's where my work lies is this, this meeting of material things and digital things and, and the experiential. Um, and also, as you mentioned, I grew up in Canada, so <laughs> I'm here right. um, to work and teach uh, and make art. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Definitely the immersion with Strata was a really wonderful thing, not something I've ever experienced in the contemporary realm. So I was hoping maybe you could just speak to why you chose Alberta for, for Strata as the subject where you got all the footage from. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think uh, initially I, it's my connection to the area. So growing up in the province uh, after I finished uh, grad school, I actually moved to Fort McMurray, which is uh, the small town of the city that is close to where I captured a lot of my footage. Um, and I taught at a, a small college there. And I think that what happened when I went there, so just for a little bit of background, this is the region where oil is, is extracted from vast petroleum deposits known as the Athabasca oil sand. So um, bitumen's mined from open pit mines and, and the landscape is really um, transformed immensely. And I, I think the, the, for me to go there and really witness it in person, um, had me thinking about um, how industry can really transform landscape. And um, I discovered this just running. <laughs> I, I love to run and, and drive and, and explore and really take my time as, as um, we'll probably talk about more in this interview in nature. And so when I, I returned and, and continued life in teaching and, and making, this, this experience of the area always stuck with me, my sensory experience of the impact um, of this region, of the industry. Um, and so basically I just, I, I really wanted to find a way to tell the story. Um, and 14 years later, here I am. It was also um, kind of started by, I had a, an earlier project in the Alpine region of Australia. And, um, and that sort of got me thinking about how um, I could explore um, these regions that um, nature and industry sort of come together and the complexities of that experience and how I can tell those stories sensorily to people that may never visit these bioregions. So, so those, two, um, those two experiences kind of got me thinking about um, going back to where I grew up and, and telling the story of what I know um, best, my actual physical experience of, of that place. 
Yeah, thank you so much. It's definitely really interesting the way that you construct environments based off other environments. Um, I thought that was, again, such a creative and unique approach to bringing that sense of place to people that have never been to that place or maybe will never see that place. And I was just curious, are there other regions in the area that have been protected from this kind of use? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, just generally speaking in Alberta, that's what I know the most about. There are, um, just like in the United States, protected areas that are managed um, sort of both federally and provincially. And um, in Alberta, I'm not sure the exact number, but it's like 35,000 square miles. So there are protected, they make up national parks, prov provincial parks, ecological reserves. And there is momentum in Canada, I think even just starting in the you know last year to protecting more of this, this land. And one thing that's really timely right now, as you ask that question, um, there's a conservative party in power in Alberta, and um, just recently they canceled an old uh, policy that prevented coal companies from surface mining in the Rocky Mountains. And this is a place where I would go as a child all the time. And that really hit me hard. I read it in the news recently and, and they've sort of paused on it um, because of the backlash. But this is this um, situation of, of politics and government and this back and forth between preservation and economic gain and, and the livelihoods of people, of course. Um, and, you know, these areas are so important to the First Nations and, you know, the protection of all these spe species and, and, you know, uh, so it's 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 complex and um, it's it's happening all the time. So there's this is always shifting and industry is always hard at work. So it's it's these forces up against each other that um, are really um, a ground, like a part of the project is is kind of trying to understand all of these complexities. Yeah, there definitely is an interesting type of tension. And on that same note, I was wondering if you could sort of speak a little bit more to like personal connection or experience in that region? In the region? Yeah, sure. Right. So I think that, you know, I think about, um, I'm just really interested in our complex relationship to where we live. And, and this is connected to, you know, many things, um, but really about the impact of human activity on, on the wilderness, on nature, and sort of the physical traces of, of human, human life. So I'm constantly, I think, in my work, trying to understand the world and my place in it. Um, and, and even if that's not a place that I'm entirely at home in. And so what's my relationship now um, to the Athabasca, Athabasca oil sands? And this is interconnected. We can talk about the XL pipeline and the relationship between different nations um, and our reliance on oil. And so um, all of this is really having to do with with where we live, but also, you know, it expands out from that. So it's personal, but it's also, you know, complex in its societal and political connections. Yeah, definitely. I was wondering if there's any like specific species or anything like that, that have either been affected by it or that you've been connected to and sort of aware of? Sure. Um, I, I, it's so vast. I could talk about <laughs> this for a very long time. It, it, the funny um, thing, the first thing that comes to my mind, and I have, uh, like I mentioned, a, a connection to the Rocky Mountains in Alberta, especially um, where I went a lot as when I was a child, we do a lot of camping um, and cross country skiing um, outdoors. And I remember <laughs> the mountain goats <laughs> um, and, you know, these, these, Goats have, um, they have these distinctive beards and really thick long winter coats. Um, so they really sur can survive these cold temperatures. But what, it, what is so fascinating about these, these creatures is that they're, they're very kind of like sure footed and they'll, they'll um, sit on the scale of sides of mountains in these rows. <laughs> and I, I just remember driving past um, these, these places where, um, you know, these animals can habitate and, and, and live um, in, these, in these very crazy conditions. I, things that also stick out to me, especially, um, you know, the boreal forest also in the um, Rocky Mountains are the trees. Um, these are the most majestic things <laughs> that populate everywhere and especially the evergreen trees. 
I think about like the Douglas firs and the spruce and and just how towering they are. They they sort of have lived longer than us and 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 just their power and mightiness is is always very grounding for me when I when I travel there. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. It seems like you're really in tune with those types of things. In a similar note, has your attention to nature kind of always been intuitive or like how did this maybe develop over time? It seems like you spent a lot of time outside and camping and doing outdoor recreational sports and things like that. Sure, I think that's a, an interesting question. And I, you know, thinking back um, to my childhood, I really have to think about how my parents encouraged it. I. Um, growing up, we were always outside. Uh, we would play and learn in the forests, the parks, the lakes. And in Canada and Alberta, where I where I lived, you know, the winter can be seven or eight months of the year. And sometimes in the minus twenty degrees Celsius, minus thirty, if it's it's very cold and just a lot of snow. And and that didn't stop us. We had full piece snow suits, and we would stay outside until we sort of lost the feeling in our fingertips. <laughs> Um, and, you know, a lot of the tent camping that I mentioned in the Rocky Mountains when I was a young child. So you're practically like sleeping in the dense, majestic forest that I, I mentioned. So you really couldn't get any closer. And I think that um, that encouragement or that space and, and time outside has really just embedded that in my body now. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've actually, I, I live um, out sort of in a more remote place and um, I really appreciate the time that I can be outside, and I think that really does come from um, spending a lot of time outside as a child. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And along that note of from such an early age, you were connected to nature, was your sort of attention to detail like sound and things like that, was that always there too? Or was that something that sort of developed at, over time in your life as an artist? Oh, I, you have such great questions. Um, I think that it was there, but I didn't um, understand or know how to frame it. Um, and um, I'll use a really good example. So for um, one of my sound classes, I use a listening exercise by Paulina Leveros. Um, and what that is, is just a frame in time to sit down and, and listen. And um, I think I was doing that all along, but not understanding the importance of it. Um, and so, so now as I, I work towards a practice in art, I'm more in tune to uh, the frame, I guess you could say. And, and what that means is sound always surrounds us. It surrounded me as a child in nature. Um, and, you know, the resonant soundscape is so important. And um, even if we aren't listening, it's there. Uh, one thing in these exercises that I find with my students is that um, they talk about how they feel about these sounds that they didn't notice before. And so that idea of the frame or, or the listening part of it, the perceptive part of it, I think, you know, maybe was I wasn't as aware of it um, when I was younger, but now I'm, I'm hyper aware of it. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting that, like you said, sound is always there, but we're not always aware of it or paying attention with our ears. I think that's a really unique way to frame it. And kind of on the note of being an artist and developing, you know, your working methods and sort of having your own voice as an artist, were there any other artists working in a similar mode that sort of encouraged this over your lifetime? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can think of many artists. I'll. I'll talk a little bit about one of the biggest um, influences on my work, and and this is a very specific experience with one of her pieces. And um, I think I mentioned uh, Janet Cardiff in one of the museum studies classes that I attended. Um, but I, when I was in college, I I got to experience her work called the Forty Part Motet. And basically, the way this piece works um, is it's forty speakers mounted on stands in a circle facing inward. Um, and it plays a 16th century choral work, but each member of the choir is represented by this a speaker, so it was recorded separately. Um, and so this, uh, I walked into this installation, the sound installation, and, and at the time I was making works on paper and drawing and, and working that way visually. And I did not know the power of immersive sound. And so walking into this piece, um, it, it blew me away in, in, the, in the way that when you 
um, feel something like that. The hairs on your back almost tingle. <laughs> and I, I, it stuck with me, uh, this idea of how um, sound um, can operate, um, you know, inside, not necessarily inside of a gallery space, but as a, as a crafted kind of artistic experience. And so um, I held on to that. And her work in general um, is very um, broad ranging from, you know, sound walks, video walks. Um, she does a lot of kind of filmic installations, but I just love her, her practice of working and thinking about the experience of the listener and the viewer. Um, and so that would be, you know, one of my uh, most inspirational or favorite um, contemporary working artists right now. Yeah, that's actually a name we've heard a lot in one of my contemporary art classes. So that's really cool that you mentioned her. And thank you again so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about your background as an artist and just as a person out in nature. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. It was really wonderful to speak with you today.